God. Man. Praise God. You know, the Bible says that King David, who's a man after God's own heart, said, he said, man, I, it's such a joy. It was so, he found such joy knowing that he was coming to the house of God. And so, man, we need to find joy in it and excitement in it. I always say, man, I'm at my best when I'm at church, not just because I put on an act, just because it's the place that creates an atmosphere for me to be at my best. And hopefully it's creating an atmosphere for you to be at your best too. Not just cosmetically when we smile and shake hands and act like we're perfect and, you know, everything's great and we didn't just fight on the way to church with our wife or... You know, she tried to tell us how to drive or something, and we got irritated. No, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a genuine joy, just coming together. Look, at, look around, man. We're all in here together. We're all in this together. <laughs> Having said that, I want you to turn to Psalms 37 with me, and we're, we're still talking about the Ten Commandments and what they mean and just going deeper and deeper into them. You know, the Bible says deep calls to deep. You know, and God just, God can, that's why you can read a scripture and get something out of it and go, wow, that's so cool. And then a year later, read it again and go, wow, that's even, that's even cooler. And you can just continually read it and continually get more out of it. You know, the Bible, man, is like digging for treasure. It's like you, you hit a, you, you, you kind of dig a little bit and you hit a treasure and you pull this box out and you're thinking, that's incredible. And then you dig, you're like, man, there, there might be more in there. So you dig a little bit more and there's another box and you're like, that's even better. And you just keep digging. You just keep digging. It's a treasure. You just keep getting more and more treasure out of it. I do. I get more and more treasure out of it. I love it. Love his word because he just teaches me and takes me. And, and, you know, he's creating in us a better person. You know, I've always taught for years that, that he makes you the best version of you you can possibly be. You know, we all know there's just one of us. We kind of act like there's a bunch of us, but we're so unique. Well, I mean, well, there's only one of us in the whole world, one of us that's ever been. We're that unique. Our own fingerprint, our own eye print. You know, we're unique. We're, we're, I mean, God makes everybody so unique. And, and, uh, and, but he, and he wants to make us and use us in, in a way that, that is not ugly, the way, the way the enemy wants to use us and the world wants to use us. Maybe other people want to use us. But he, he wants to take our lives and make it purposeful and useful and bless us for, for allowing him to work through us and, and, uh, and use us as a tool, you know? I've used, I don't know about you guys, but, you know, I've, I've used, I've been tool deficient. What does that mean? I had to hang something, I couldn't find a hammer. And then I find it later in the yard because my kids took it and broke toys with it or something and left it in the yard. I'm mowing the yard, and I'm like, man, there's my hammer. So what I took, got a shoe and tried to nail it, you know, with a shoe. And, you know, you can, you can put a nail in a wall with a shoe. You know, sometimes I've gotten, you know that, I don't, some of you might not do this, but I tenderize steak. So, you know, you have that steak hammer. In fact, I, I go get that. You can nail a nail in with a, with a tenderizer, <laughs> you know. You guys think about all the things you use. I've used, the, I've used a crescent wrench, you know. Can't find a hammer, I'll use a crescent wrench and nail it in with that. And it works, but then you get a hammer and you use it. It's like, oh, that works so much better. And sometimes, because of our own choices, we're, 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 we're off just that much. It's working. It's functional. It's functional. It's, 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 it's a life, but, but we're not completely lined up with the will of God, so we're not exactly in the right place doing the right thing. And, and, and life is harder because of it. But when you line your life up with God's will for your life, it, it's just, it's not that there's not, there's not, you know, there's still a hammer hitting a nail. There's still some pressure. There's still some work that needs to be done, but it's so much more efficient. It's so much easier and it, it flows so much better when we line up with the will of God. It's just, it's just the truth. It just makes life so much more joyful. You know, we hear people say all the time, if you find what you were made to do, 
what you were called to do and you, and you love what you do, you'll never work a day in your life. You'll get paid to do what you enjoy doing. I get paid to do what I was called to do and enjoy doing, what I was created to do, what I was created in my mother's womb to do. I do what I'm called to do. It doesn't mean that there's not obstacles. It doesn't mean that there's not been stuff that I have to overcome. It doesn't mean there's never been any junk or any you know, stuff that, bad days, but even in those days, I'm still, I'm still functioning in what I'm called to do, and there's a joy in it. And the reason I can overcome is because I'm functioning and what I'm called to do and operating in the will of God. He wants that for all of us. I said he wants that for all of us. So Psalms 37, three says, trust, in, trust rely, lean on, rely on, and be confident. I'm reading out the Amplified Bible. Be confident in the Lord and do good. Trust God. Trust God and do good. What does it mean to do good? It means to do the word. God alone is good, amen? He's good, and it, so if we operate according to his word and his ways and his will and his truth, that's when we're doing good. He said, trust him and do good. Why does he say trust him before he says do good? Because you have to trust him to do what's right, that no matter what it looks like, that it might not turn out for you right, by doing what's right, by doing what is good, we trust him that when we do good, that he will bless us. He'll take care of us. It's a trust issue. It's trusting God over our flesh. It's trusting God over this, that, and another thing. And that's what the Ten Commandments are all about. It's about trusting God to do what's right. And then he, because you've sown that, because you've sown loyalty, you've sown trust, you've sown faith, you've, your confidence is in God and not in yourself and not in your circumstances, but in doing what God has created you to do and doing what God's asked us to do. Then he says this, if you'll do that, so, uh, he said, so shall you dwell in the land and feed surely on his faithfulness. We'll, we'll feed We'll feast and feed on God's faithfulness to do what he said he's going to do. But we be, th this whole thing begins with us trusting God and acting on what he's called us to act on and do what he's called us to do. We know that the word of God says that if you're just a hearer of the word but not a doer, it doesn't do you any good. You're, he's, in fact, it talks about being self-deceived, that you deceive yourself. And this is the deception. I talk about it all the time. You deceive yourself. You plant junk, you plant bad things, but then somehow you've deceived yourself into thinking that you're going to get a harvest of good things. I see people in relationships, they treat their spouse like, they treat their spouse horribly, and, and then they expect their spouse to treat them great. And they're like mad when they don't. Like, what's wrong with you? What's wrong with me? It's you. What's wrong with me is you. you we, we go to work and, and we don't sow good seed at work, but we want the promotion. We want a pay raise. If you plant corn, you get. But we somewhat, that's what being a hearer of the word and not a doer of the word is saying is that I can plant pineapples and get coconuts. You're not. If you plant pineapples, you get pineapples. I would, man, I would think someone's crazy if they took me to a pineapple farm and said, man, I planted all this, you know, I planted this, look at this, look at this beautiful farm I've, I've, I've got, a whole farm full of coconuts. <laughs> well, I'm not an agriculturalist, but I can tell the difference between a pineapple and a coconut. And I'm like, well, is this a different type of coconut? Because they look like pineapples to me. Well, I, I, intend, I planted pineapples, but I expected to grow coconuts. Well, you, you made a mistake. 
Guys, we can't, we can't, we can't sow disloyalty and reap loyalty. We can't sow unfaithfulness and reap faithfulness. We're going to harvest what we have planted. And so God wants us to plant good seed. So he gives us instruction. Why? Because he wants us to produce a good harvest. And he's a great father. He's a tremendous father. He's the father, he's the father of the year. He's the father of the, the decade. He's the father of infinity. He's the father of fathers. And he wants us to, to produce good things in our life. So he gives us instructions. And he didn't just say it. Because if he just said it one or two times, uh, uh, Warren, we'd forget. No, he wrote it down. So we could carry it around with us. Well, what do I do here, God? Well, let me see. He wrote it down for us and said, here you go. Read this. Carry it around. If you have questions, look it up. And now with your phones and the Bible on the phone, you can just type in any, anything, any question you have, and you can find answers. Not all of them are right, but you can find answers, thoughts on these subject matters. And you can, you can begin to discern what is being taught accurately and what is not. Man, we need to value that because not too many generations ago, no one had access to the Bible. Except for, except for priests that, that a lot of times would manipulate, not all the time, but would manipulate people into doing what they wanted them to do because they couldn't read it for themselves. Gosh, we're so blessed. Man, we're blessed. We're a blessed people and a blessed nation. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Go with me to the book of Exodus. Exodus chapter 20. And I, I started on commandment number seven last week. I'm going to try to finish that up and get to commandment number eight. Somebody said to me the other day, they said, I I've memorized the commandments differently than the way you're reading them. Well, the, if, you're, if you grew up Catholic, then you memorized them differently. They're, they're the same Ten Commandments, but uh, they're, they're written differently. They combined uh, commandment number one and two together, where you have no other gods before me and no graven images. They combined that and separated covetousness, and so the number's going to be different. So your number's going to be different. But it's the same commandments. Now, I'm not going to get into why they did that. But someday I'll, I'll explain that, why they did that. Well, let me just say, think about graven images. Why you'd want to lessen the impact of that by not making it a separate commandment. Someone say amen. And so, but it's the same commandments. And so, you know, but if, they're, if the number's off, it's, it's, it's just because you memorized them differently. But in, in Exodus chapter 20, verse 14, we talked about last week, you shall not commit adultery. You shall not commit adultery. I'm gonna give you some more information about that. Why? And this is not in your notes, so if you wanna write this down, you can. That God intended marriage to be a direct reflection of our relationship with him. The Bible calls Jesus the husband, the husbandman, and in the church, the bride, his bride. The, the, the supper, the feast that we're going to partake of when we get to heaven is called the what? Marriage Supper of the Lamb. It's, the, it's, a, it's a wedding. It's a wedding. There's a wedding taking place where uh, the, the head and, and, and the one, that, the helper, all comes together. And so marriage is a direct reflection of our relationship with God and a direct reflection to our children and our culture about who God is. And that's why Satan is in overdrive trying to destroy marriages from the inside out so that he can damage the reputation of God and destroy the relationship between the church and, and Jesus. Marriage, is a, a successful marriage, is a direct reflection of our relationship with God. 
It is supposed to be a reflection to our children about how you're faithful and loyal, how there's a leader and then there's a helper and that you work together. There's a president and a vice president. They're co-laborers, husband and wife working together to accomplish things. Not working against each other, but working together to accomplish. If your marriage is in unity, then you're working together. You have common goals, common interests that you're working towards. If you don't have that, you're going to have strife and division. You're going to have divorce. What does divorce mean? It means a tearing away, a ripping away. It means to be divided, to be ripped apart, torn apart. And that's, what, that's why God deals with adultery. What else does he call adultery, church family? When we, idolatry, exactly. Someone said idolatry. When we worship other gods, he calls it adultery. He uses the same word. Why? Because marriage between a man and a woman, between husband and wife, is a direct reflection of the church, the people who claim to be believers in God. That way. It's a direct, it's an it's a image, it's a mirror, it's supposed to be a mirror image for people to see. This is who our God is. This is how he operates. This is how he functions. This is how he loves. This is how he respects. This is how it works together. And that's why I say he wants to destroy it. Destroy marriage between a man and a woman. And now create marriages between two men or two women. Or he wants to, he wants to pervert it. He wants to twist it so it doesn't look the way God intended it to be. There's roles that men play and roles that women play. And they're both a function and a reflection of who God is. Come on. They're both a reflection about who our Father is, who God is. And there's a, there's a huge attack on masculinity in our nation. Why? Because God has always reflected his masculine. So in order to tear down God, we've got to tear down masculinity. I'm not talking about machoism. I'm not talking about two-bit dictators. I'm not talking about control freaks. I'm not talking about guys who have perverted their masculinity and have perverted uh, uh, their authority by mistreating people or abusing people or, or beating people or doing those things. I'm talking about real masculinity that loves and leads and sacrifices and lays down its life. But, but Satan is trying to destroy it. The sole purpose is to attack God. The sole purpose is to destroy marriage and destroy family so that our children look and see. And they have trouble trusting God because they can't trust daddy. They have trouble trusting God because they can't trust mama. They have trouble trusting God because marriage is, is this way instead of this way. So they can't see how it's supposed to work between them and God because they can't see the, the image, the, the reflection of between God, a man and a woman and God and his church. It's, it's supposed to be an image, a reflection of our relationships and our loyalty to one another. That's why he says, don't commit adultery. It says, the statistics right now say that both men and women 41% of women and 40 to 50% of men say they have committed adultery. And those are the ones that have acted on it physically, not the ones that have acted on it in, uh, uh, in, their, in their imagination or emotionally. Every, every act of adultery starts emotionally first, then moves into the physical. We allow, we allow it to start in taking a place in our imagination and in our emotions before the actions take place. Satan always attacks the mind. Because if he can get you to meditate it long, on it long enough and that becomes your focus, everybody say focus. That becomes your focus, that's what you're gonna go towards. We had a great conversation in, in, in men's prayer yesterday about focus. and One of the guys spoke up and talked about focus, and, and I've taught, taught this message before, that when I was in driver's ed, and maybe some of you remember this too, that you're in driver's ed, they tell you when you're driving, do not stare at the other person's headlights. Now, why do they say that to us? Well, what? 
Well, it'll blind you, but what, does anybody else know what else they used to tell you? You'll go that direction, especially if you're tired and you start staring. I mean, that's how some people have hit each other head on. So it blinds you and it draws you to it. He was talking about, it was Bruce, he said, especially on a motorcycle, they say, be careful not to, because what you focus on, you know, have you ever stared at something too long and you're, the next thing you know, you're off the shoulder, you know, like, oh, I look too, I look too much that way, right? Because it, your focus pulls you, it, it, it directs you. So Satan's always trying to mess with your focus, trying to get your eyes off of what is right and off of Jesus and off his word by, by, by getting you stuck staring at what you're not supposed to be staring at, looking at things that you shouldn't be looking at. It's an epidemic. I said, this is an epidemic. If I told you 50% of all people had polio, you'd say, this is an epidemic. We better fix it. I mean, there'd be a cry in our nation, like, oh my gosh, 50% of our children have polio? Have you ever seen, some of you don't understand, I grew up with kids that had polio. I mean, their bodies are distorted, and, and they're weak, and they're messed up, and they, they had polio as a child. They hadn't solved it yet. But man, when, when people started seeing that in children, man, they went after it and fixed it, and they, they found a cure for it. Well, there's a disease called adultery. That we need to find the cure is Jesus. Sixty percent of single adults, and this is when he's talking about adultery. You know, he's talking about sexual sin, and so he says sixty percent of single adults who attend church reported being sexually active, and fifty percent of them with multiple partners. These are people who go. These are the people that go to church. I'm not throwing rocks at anybody. I have no rocks to throw. Before I knew Jesus, I did what the world did. I'm not throwing rocks. There's forgiveness. But I want you to catch this statement. God does not forgive evil, but he forgives individuals. But he doesn't forgive evil. When he said to the woman caught in adultery, he said, I don't, I don't condemn you either, otherwise I forgive you, but go sin no more. He went right after the sin. He condemned the sin, but there's hope for the individual. But we can never say that because individuals can be forgiven that somehow the sin is all right. Or because we love somebody that the sin is all right. If you really love them, in love and not with rocks, just beating them and pelting them out of hatred or anger or fear, but out of love for them, you'll tell them, hey man, you continue down that path, it's not going to go well with you. God will not honor that. You won't even make, the Bible says if you die and you're practicing these sins, I mean, this is your way of life, that you will not make it into the kingdom of heaven. You won't go to heaven, and you won't, live a, you won't live a blessed life on the earth. You'll satisfy your flesh, but after a while, that's going to lead to destruction. When, you sat, when your life is to satisfy just your fleshly desires, the Bible says it leads to, to sin and death. Death of relationships, death of your self-esteem, death of your value. The people that I see addicted to porn and sexual sin, man, after a period of time, they are so depressed. They feel so devalued. They feel so dirty. They feel so lost. They're living in a dark hole. Lust has no bottom. It'll take you even. You have, there'll be something else you have to do, and then you have to do this, and then you have to do this to even get satisfied, to even scratch that itch. You just, it just keeps taking you lower and lower and lower. There's no, if you're, if you're being drawn by this or you're participating in this, listen, I'm saying, to this, saying this to you as a warning out of love. Stop. Stop right now because you're digging a hole that you can dig so deep that God says in Romans 1 that if you get deep enough and per Perversion of sexuality that you'll be turned over to a reprobate mind. You know what that means? Unable to obtain salvation. That means your heart will get so hard that you'll go so far that you can't get yourself out of that hole. You'll dig yourself literally all the way to the pit. Stop. 
Change your focus. Start, start allowing God to help you. Ask him to forgive you. Receive his forgiveness. And then ask him to help you overcome it. He will. He has. Many of us have been there. Many of us. The Bible said, Paul said to the, one of the church, he said, many of you acted this way. Talking about sexual sin and other sins. He said, many of you acted that way, but it shouldn't be that way anymore. Please consider the cost. Jesus always offers the possibility of forgiveness and hope to the person and an opportunity to change, to repent. That's what repent means. We know what repent means, right? Change for the better. Repent means change. Jesus went about preaching, change for the better. John the Baptist preached, repent. Change for the better. You know, a lot of times we hear that word repent, we think John the Baptist is standing up there going, repent. That's what it always sounded like to me. That word repent always sounded like, oh my gosh, that's like, it sounded like fire. Like, man, I was going to get burnt by it, you know. Does anybody understand what I mean? It just sounded so religious and I didn't understand it. And it sounded like, you know, I just better stay away from that, you know. And so I would, I, I pulled back, but, but then when I understand what it, when I understood what it meant, that it means change for the better, I'm like, okay, I mean, God's an encourager. Change for the better. Come on, change for the better. Come on, I want to make your life, God always wants to make our life better. Not easy, but better. Not safe, but better. In the story of the Chronicles of Narnia, the one kid asked the other one when, they, when the little girl was, was taking the boy to see the lion. And, and, and the little boy says something like, well, you know, he's a lion? Yeah. Is he safe? And she looked and goes, no. He's not safe, but he's good. What does that mean? That we're going to be in danger? Well, it's just when you walk in faith, it don't always feel safe. It doesn't always feel easy, but boy, it's good. It's good. And that's what he wants. He, he wants to encourage us to change, encourage us to grow. Mm. So what do we do? Go with me to Galatians 5. I'm just going to give you a few thoughts. Galatians chapter 5. Verse 16. So number one, how do, we, how do we handle this? We gotta walk it out. So number one, we have to walk it out. Galatians 5, 16 says, but I say walk and live habitually. Everybody say habitually. In the Holy Spirit, responsive to and controlled and guided by the Spirit. Romans 8 says the same thing. If you're led by your flesh, it'll lead to sin and death if you're led by your spirit. Otherwise, your heart that's been changed by God. And you've, and you've taken what, what the Holy Spirit, which has changed your heart, he does that all on his own. You ask him and he does it. That's supernatural. But then he says, take my word, which is full of my spirit, and renew your mind. Get your mind and your heart walking together. The only way you can habitually walk with God is that your mind and your heart have to be in agreement. Most people don't realize you're a three-part being. You have a flesh, you have a mind, which is your will, your intellect, your emotions, and you have a spirit, which is the, the inner man, the, the heart of a, of a person, the real you in here. You're a three-part being, and guess what? God made you a democracy. So if three are voting, what does it take to win a vote. How many? Two. So if your mind is still connected to your flesh, you're going to outvote your spirit. And that's what makes people miserable. That they know Jesus. They're, 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 they've been changed on the inside. He's changed because he, they, they asked him to. And they've been changed. But their mind's not hooked up. So they keep doing things they don't want to do. I'm like, man, why do I keep doing what I don't want to do? It's because your mind's not right. You have to, God supernaturally, when you ask him, he does all the work and changes you on the inside, but you have to do some work to change this up here. 
You have to read the word and start to act on it. And so if you get this mind hooked up with your spirit, that when, you, when something comes up, some sexual temptation comes up, and, and you're tempted by it, by your flesh, and say, man, that, that looks tasty over there, that looks possible, that all of a sudden your spirit man will rise up and say, oh, no, that's not, that is, that's the deceitfulness of sin. It looks really good, but it'll kill you. It'll kill you. And then, you're, then it goes to the vote. Your flesh is voted yes. Your spirit is voted no. Then it goes to the decider. And, and, and you start going through the Rolodex of your emotions, your thoughts. And, how you, and if you come up with the word, you'll say, hold on a second. God said don't commit adultery. He said, don't even commit it in your imagination and in your, in your ideas, your thoughts, and the, the way you focus your eyes. And so when that, and then so your mind connected with the word votes with your spirit and says, oh no, come here, flesh, you're coming over here. We're gonna walk away from this and we're gonna run to God. Oh, and so he says, responsive to the spirit, guided by the spirit. He said, then you will certainly not gratify the cravings and desires of the flesh of human nature without God. Without God, that's all people want to do is satisfy their flesh. So if they're full of gossip, they gossip constantly without any check. You know, when I, before I knew Jesus, I partied without any, I had no conscience about it. I didn't feel guilty after I drank all night. You know what I felt? What, what did some of you think the next day? What? I can't hear some of you. What? No, I didn't think, why did I, why did I do that? Dang, that's it. I can't. When do we start again? That's what I thought. When, when, when do we do this again? Because I had no conscience about it. My heart did not convict me. And that's how people are without Jesus. Without God, there has, there's no conviction. It's just lust. It's just satisfying my flesh. So I'm going to do whatever is best for me at the moment. The Bible calls it the deceitfulness of sin. It's pleasant. It feels so good for a moment, but it costs so much. People will tell kids that, man, uh, uh, this, they'll, they'll, they'll make it sound like sin doesn't feel good. Sin does feel good for a moment. You know how I know it? Because I did it, and the Bible says it. It's pleasant for a season, the Bible says. It feels good for a season until you have to pay the price. then the price is much higher than what you wanted to pay. Cost you much more. I don't know how many men and women I've seen crying in my office. Why did I do this? I've lost my whole family over this. I've lost my dignity. Why did I act? Why did I do it? Because you allowed yourself to be controlled by your flesh instead of by the word of God and the spirit of God. And it's what you focus on. If you focus on that, you're going to be drawn. You're just going to get closer and closer to it. you got to change your focus. That's why Jesus said, fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. So if you stay focused on him, he'll not only begin a good work in you, he'll finish a good work in you, in me. That's number one, walk it out. Number two, we have to avoid bad counsel. Go with me to Psalms 1. We're almost to the next commandment. Psalms 1. This is so powerful. It says blessed. What does blessed mean? Happy. Oh, come on. You guys are supposed to be preaching with me today. Come on. We're in this together. What does blessed mean? God always begins with happy. Some people say, well, God don't want you happy. Oh, yeah. Yes, he does. When people would, when I saw religious people who believed that, that if you smiled, your face would crack and fall off. I, would, I said, well, God, I have, there's more people in the world that are happier than people that are in the church I attended. They look miserable. At least people out partying were laughing and, you know, we know it always ended ugly, but at least for a moment. 
That's how people get turned off. Someone asked me the other day, Pastor Troy, you think you're getting too old to be the pastor of Church on the Move? <laughs> no, it wasn't, it, wasn't a, it wasn't a slam. It was another pastor who's asking that about himself. And I said, I said, man, I've thought that. But then I think, golly, I, the word of God says, though I perish, though I'm getting older on the outside, on the inside, I'm renewed every day. I, man, I'm, I'm passionate and I'm more excited about the things of God today than I was at 19 or 20. I have more energy. I have more desire. I have more passion. I have more excitement about it now than I ever have. I'm like, so my answer to that question was no. Freddie ain't ready to retire. Man, we're going to go at it. My best years aren't behind me. They're in front of me. And your best years aren't behind you either. Unless you leave them there. Unless you decide not to grow. Unless you decide not to move forward. But if you decide to go forward, man, you'll be happy. You'll be fortunate. You'll be prosperous. And you'll be enviable. One of my kids said to me the other day, something happens all the time for me that's good. And they said, man, dad, that happens all the time for you. And I just, I said, that's because I'm blessed. I'm happy. I'm fortunate. That means that things just happen for me. Not, not all the time, but in this particular area, it happens all the time. I'm just fortunate in that area because of what? Because of what I'm about to read to you. Not because I'm just Troy Smotherman. It had nothing to do with me. It has everything to do with the God I serve. He said, blessed, happy, fortunate, prosperous, and amiable is the man who walks and lives not in the counsel of the ungodly. So number one, you have to walk with God. Number two, you have to avoid bad counsel. Don't listen to the world. So how do we listen to the world? Man, I'm going to get right in your culture. What music are you listening to? Not all secular music is evil, okay? But if it's talking about Sex outside of marriage and all this junk and cussing. and I mean, I mean, guys, you listen to that long enough, it's thumping in your head. I went to the OU Texas Tech game last night, and they have some pretty cool traditions at Tech. I'm an OU fan, and we won, and so praise God. But uh, <laughs> boomer sooner. But, uh, but I like Texas Tech. I root for them every, every time they're playing except Oklahoma. And so, but they had some great, cool traditions. And I watched all these, I mean, I don't know, 50, 60,000 fans. And they've got their Texas Tech right, right. And they're rock. I mean, it's, the music is thumping. Thump, thump, thump. And they're thumping. And they're singing the words. And they put the words up on the screen. So every, I mean, they showed these 80-year-olds. I, I mean, but they're, they're rocking it. Some guy in his 50s, he pulled his shirt up, he had his, and he would rub his belly. And the cameraman went back to him, and he did it again. And the, the crowd went nuts, and they're rocking. I mean, they're just, they're rocking this thing. And they're, I mean, they're just, I mean, the 60, 70,000 people just rocking it out. And I'm like, man, oh, I came to church today. I'm like, man, why didn't we rock it out like that? They're doing that over a football game. Woo, come on. But I thought about the music and what they were, they just knew all the words. Even these 80-year-olds knew all the words to party. We're going to party over here. And then, and they were way, I mean, I'm like, wow, the, the impact music and stuff has on our culture and our thinking and our processes. What we listen to, what we allow in here gets in here. Don't follow the counsel of the ungodly. I hang out with people that don't know Jesus, but I don't hang out with them on a regular basis. Otherwise, I don't reject them. Man, I'll love on them and talk to them and try to connect with them, but I'm not going to run with them. Why? Because they'll begin to counsel you. It'll begin in little things. You know, you hang around. You know, when I grew up, everybody said, man. Hey, man. What's up, man? And I still use that, but now people use dude. And I got around a bunch of my pastor friends and some of my kids that, that use dude or some of the young people that use dude. Now I say dude. Why? Because they influence you. And you don't realize they're counseling you. You hang around someone long enough, they're counseling you whether you know it or not. Who's counsel? Who are you listening to? Who's speaking? What does counsel mean? Who's speaking 
things into your life on a regular, habitual basis? Who's, who's speaking to you about who you are and what you believe? Who's speaking to you? Who are you listening to culturally? Because your culture, your culture will begin to infect your mindset. And then your focus will change. Don't listen to the counsel of the ungodly. Following their advice, their plans, or in purposes. Don't follow their advice. It grieves my heart when people going through trouble turn to their ungodly family members and ungodly coworkers to get counsel. You don't go to someone who has failed miserably at marriage time and time again and ask them the counsel on how to have a great marriage. You're, they don't have any. They can tell you what not to do, and that's, that's okay, but they can't tell you what to do. Don't go to your mom or dad or your sister or brother that doesn't know God and vent to them about your spouse or your kids because they don't have anything good to say. You gotta go to someone and vent to somebody and get that pressure off of you that somebody at the end of all you said and all the junk you've said, they say, okay, I'm glad you got that off of you. Now let's, let's get some direction here. Let's, let's get refocused. Let's just do what's right. What, what have I taught? I taught a whole message on this. What do you do when you don't know what to do? Come on, church, you forgot that. You do the, thanks Mark, you do the next right thing in God's eyes. You do the next right thing. Avoid bad counsel. He said, Don't, nor stand submissive and inactive in the path where sinners walk, nor sits down to relax and rest where the scornful and the mockers gather. You can't listen to mockers and people mocking God all the time and not become a mocker. You can't listen to people who are scornful. What does it mean to be scornful? They talk bad about the church all the time. Eventually, you're gonna talk bad about the church. People who don't go to church and say, well, I'm a Christian, but I don't go to church. I'm a Christian, I don't believe in pastors. I'm a Christian. Well, God believes in pastors. God believes in church. God believes in people gathering together. He knows it's not perfect. He's constantly correcting it. But it's good. I said it's good. So don't, don't listen to them. They have nothing good for you. He said, you're blessed if you don't listen to them. Then in verse three, he said, no, in verse two, he said, but his delight and desire in the law of the Lord and on his law, the precepts, the instructions and teachings of God, he habitually meditates, ponders, studies by day and by night. Otherwise, his focus is on the, the word of God and doing and operating according to the word of God. Because what? Psalms 37, three, because I, don't, I trust God. I trust God and I'm gonna do what is right in his eyes and I'm gonna feed on God's faithfulness and he's gonna come through for me. Pastor, it's been 10 years. Oh, what if it happens tomorrow? Is it worth 10 years? Woo. I expect massive, mass. I'm talking about Red Sea parting, Jesus coming, miracles of my life and my family and your family every day. I wake up with an expectation. God is moving today. Though a thousand fall at my left hand and 10,000 at my right hand, I'm gonna still believe that God is on the throne and he's moving. He's gonna do something awesome. And he takes what is meant for evil and turns it around. It doesn't mean evil doesn't happen, but he turns it around. All things work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Otherwise, we are, we are our hearts set on his purpose for marriage, his purpose for sex, his purpose for intimacy, his purpose. His purpose for life. Pastor Troy, why do you, 
Why are you so excited? Why are you so loud? Listen, I, I listen to the passionate at the games. I listen to the passionate of the world. I see how passionate the world is, how passionate Satan it is to draw people to the pit, to destroy their lives in this life, in the destruction in the next. And man, I see even greater passion in my Jesus that said, oh, forgive them for they know not what they do. And I see the passion in his sacrifice. I see the love and the joy and the passion and the excitement. The Bible says, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. There was an excitement in the, in the midst of all his pain. There was a joy inside of him that said, I'm doing this to save them. I'm doing this to rescue them. How dare us not be just as passionate and excited and purposeful as them, as he, as he is. We need to be as purposeful and excited as he is that for the sacrifices that we make for his cause, that there's a joy inside of us that we're honoring God and that blessings will come out of it, that, that uh, opportunities and we'll feed on his faithfulness in this life and forever in the next. I preached you up today. Hope you leave here better than when you came. Determined, passionate, excited, focused, desiring. If you're, if you're caught up in sexual sin, if you're sleeping with your boyfriend, sleeping with your girlfriend, you're tempted or acting or imagining, then man, you, you listen to God's warning. It's not warning you to rob your firm. He's warning you to rob you of the consequence of it. There's just consequences that are not good. They're not good. And I, ha I have a sense I'm supposed to share this. My wife has taught on this so many times. And she glued two pieces of paper together. And, and then she ripped the other paper off. And it left, you know how that, it'll leave pieces. And, he's, and she's taught on this, that each sexual partner you have, you leave a piece of yourself. You lose and your life looks like that ripped up paper. Well, pastor, I've done that. Is that how it's got to be? No, it doesn't have to stay that way. God will fill all the holes, but you've got to say, God, forgive me. Restore me. All those pieces I gave away of my self-esteem, who I am to somebody else out of sin, I want those back. And God says, I can give them back. And he's the only one that can. But you have to ask him to forgive you and receive. You have to actually receive that forgiveness and shake off guilt and condemnation and shame and say, God, I'm walking in your forgiveness, not my own. And because of that, I won't be beaten down by guilt, condemnation, and shame. I'm going to rise up and let you feel and give me back my self-esteem Give me back my purity. Give me back the pieces of myself that I gave away. That was for someone in this room. I never thought I could get those pieces back. I never thought I could have a pure heart or feel pure or feel right until I met Jesus. And he gave me all my pieces back. Oh, it felt so good to have all those things I gave away for a moment of pleasure. I thoroughly hope that you enjoyed the message and got something out of it that you can apply to your day-to-day -day life. Because that's what God's about, is living with us day by day and having a relationship day by day. And in order to establish a relationship with Him, if you never have, it's important that you ask Him. You know, he, He's extended His hand of love and He he came and died for us, and he's made a move, and he said, listen, I love you, I care about you. I died for you to save your life. And now it's our turn to respond. And let me say something about God. He said in his word that his justice triumphs, or his mercy triumphs over his justice. And the gap between justice and mercy is grace. What grace is, is an unmerited favor. It means I didn't deserve this, I can't earn it. It's just a gift of mercy. It's a gift of favor that I cannot earn, did not earn, that he's just giving as a gift. And he's offering that to you. Let me say this to you about God. He's a God of justice. In any nation, in any people, any household, if, there's not, if it's not just, if it's not right, if it's not fair, then there's going to be chaos. There's going to be all kinds of problems and hurt feelings and victims and, 
and it's just going to be ugly. And that's not who God is. So his justice is pure and right. And what justice demanded was that anybody who sinned pay the penalty of sin, which is eternal death. And God, that's that grace, that's that mercy party, tipped the scales in our favor by sending Jesus to say, I'm going to die for your sin, and I'm going to conquer sin's right to dominate our lives that Adam gave over mankind, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to eliminate sin's right to dominate you. Then I'm going to do this. Then I'm going to give you eternal life. And he said, anybody that will ask me for that, I will save. So I want to pray a prayer with you if you've never prayed or you've, you've prayed before and you've fallen. I want to pray with you too to get back up. If you've never prayed, I want to pray with you to establish a personal relationship with God and let him save you. Let him help you. That's what he wants to do. He loves you. He loves me. That's what he came to do, but he won't force it on you. He's extending his mercy. Don't demand justice over mercy. Don't demand that he treat you you know, with justice and give you what you deserve. Because if you do, you're not gonna like the results. Take advantage of the gift of mercy while you can. And pray this with me. I'm gonna ask that you close your eyes to remove distractions around you. And then I'm gonna ask you to speak this. You don't have to whisper it and don't yell it, but just speak it in a normal voice. And just be honest and sincere with him. And say this with me, say, God, I believe that you sent Jesus to die for my sins and for anybody's sins that will believe it. I believe you love us and love me that much. And because I do, I ask that you forgive me of all my sins. And I believe that you raised Jesus from the dead and you conquered sin's right to dominate me and sin's penalty, eternal death. And you want to save me from that. Well, I believe that, and because I do, I say to you, Jesus, you are the Lord, Jesus Christ of my life. You gave your life to save me. Now I give you my life. I trust you to teach me, to lead me, to guide me, and to teach me how to live life, and life abundantly. It's what you came to give me. Teach me. And I thank you for forgiving me and saving me, restoring me. In Jesus' name I pray. Thank you. Amen. Now that was a great decision that you made to pray. And I want to encourage you, if you don't have a church home, no place to go to church, come to Church on the Move. We didn't pray this prayer to trick you into coming to church. It's not, it's not a game. We're, we're the family of God. We're not going to be perfect. You're not going to be perfect. We're not going to be perfect. But man, we're a family. And we want to invite you, if you don't have a church home, come to Church on the Move and join us. We need your gift and you need our gift. We need your help and you need our help. And so come join us. In the meantime, God bless you. Have an awesome, awesome day.